Afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see so, so many people here so soon after lunch. Um, this uh, little t presentation is uh, really intended for people who are relatively new to contesting. Um, I know there are some, a lot of uh, people here who are quite experienced, so I hope they will bear with me if I um, uh, go over something that they already know. Uh, just to give me an idea, how many people here would consider themselves inexperienced or have no experience of contests? O only a few, right, half a dozen. Okay, well, what we're going to cover is what are contests? What are they good for and what are they not so good for? Uh, we look at one or two uh, examples of contests for beginners. I'll talk briefly about contest logging. Um, i review the modes that there are for <coughs> contesting. Uh, contesting on the internet, now there's a hot topic, <laughs> dear to everybody's heart. And then we'll maybe have time for a few questions and demonstrations. <coughs> so um, these are just my informal definitions. Uh, contests are operating events with time limits. And they can be anything from an hour to 48 hours. In the past, when contests first started in the 30s and 40s, they sometimes went on for two, two, one or two weeks. And even in the 60s and 70s, there were a couple of major contests that lasted for 96 hours over two full weekends. And the idea <coughs> in a contest, as in any competitive event, is to do things fast, to work as many stations as you can within the time limit, and you get points and multipliers Typically, points you get more points for a station that's further away, for example, in another continent. And you might get multipliers for each different country that you work. <coughs> and contests can be, um, by the way, uh, because my experience is with HF mainly, I'm just referring to HF contests in this presentation. And the contests may be single band or multi band. Anyone give me an, uh, uh, an example of single band contests? I, yeah, IRTS 80 meters counties, and there's also a 40 meters counties contest. Um, the RSGB has 80 meter uh, contests uh, each month on separate contests for CW, sideband, and data. And contests may be for single operator or for multi operators. The multi operator ones tend to be longer contests, typically 24 hours or more. And the contest can be single mode, uh, CW, or sideband, and sometimes mixed mode, CW sideband, and perhaps <coughs> even data, RTTY. Um, now, what do we, what's the minimum information you need uh, for a QSO to be a QSO? What do you have to exchange? Yeah, anything else? You have to exchange call signs. I don't think you have to exchange anything else. To me, a valid QSO is the exchange and acknowledgement of call signs. And in contests, you don't even have to, ex both people concerned don't have to exchange call signs because usually one station is calling another. And when you're calling another station, you don't give that station's call sign, you just give your own. And the station that you're calling knows you're calling him because you're on the, that frequency. So the information exchange is often RST, which is almost invariably 59 or 599. It could be a serial, which would be number one for your first contest, and uh, two for your second, and so on. Now, what are contests good for? Well, really, you can work lots of stations quickly without having to go through the usual, what I call rubber stamp QSO. Your five and nine, QDH is Dublin, name Paul, rig is a K3, Weather's lovely. <laughs> please, QSL, next, please. You know, contest, cut, out, cut that all out, and uh, you can get on to the next one very quickly. It's a good way to add to your uh, country totals because contest stations like you to call them because at, at the very least you'll, you'll represent extra points and you might represent a new country, Ireland. You get lots of QSLs, but that's only a benefit if you like QSLs. Uh, it's a good way to improve your CW because you can take 
contest at your own pace. Um, in contests, there are two modes. Either you're calling other stations, or sorry, you're answering other stations, or you're putting out CQs. And when you start, the last thing you do is put out CQs, because if two or more stations call you at once, you simply won't know what to do. <coughs> so what you do at first is what's known as search and pounce, where you call other stations. And the way you do that is you just uh, wait till they finish transmitting and give your call sign. And we'll, we'll have a little bit of practice between us at that in, in a few minutes. Um, they're, they're a good way to get used to pileups, but that's really only when you graduate to the stage of calling CQ or calling contest. And if you have two or three or four or maybe a lot more stations calling you at once, it's intimidating at first until you get used to it. It's a quick way to renew acquaintances. It's nice to work stations that you've worked before, even if you don't say much to them. Um, you can improve your station, especially your antennas. There's no point in having a nice station like this with expensive equipment and you know two or three or four thousand euros worth and spending only a hundred or two hundred on an antenna. It's a, a complete waste of money. Now people say, um, well, sure, what does it matter? I can work everything I hear. And so you can, but you have absolutely no idea of what you can't hear. And um, once you get a beam or get used to a beam, the difference between that and uh, a G5 RV or even a dipole is like night and day because you can turn the beam in the right direction <coughs> to get uh, the strongest signal. And you hear so many more stations that you simply wouldn't hear. Uh, without the beam. And what are contests not so good for? Well, the usual objections are that contesters don't, just don't care. We've been running this uh, net for 20 years in this frequency every weekend and, you know, contests land on top of us, contesters <coughs> land on top of us. That can happen, but uh, nobody has a, a particular right to any frequency in the bands. So the people that think contesters don't care are the people who don't do contesting. And you tend to get lots of unwanted QSLs. Anybody got any comments? By the way, f feel free to. <laughs> Jerry, you're laughing. <laughs> the, the, same, the same things all the time. Yeah. 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 Right. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, there's no formal entry requirements to start contesting. Absolutely anybody can join in. There's no entry fee. You don't have to belong to a club. You don't even have to send in a log. You don't have a minimum uh, number of QSOs, though it's usually <coughs> better to have more than one. Um, and the stations you call are invariably happy to, uh, that you're calling them. And particularly in the later stages of the, 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 the big contests. By the way, does anybody know what the big contests are? Uh, beginners? Do you, do you know the names of any contests? Well, one of the, the main big one, the major contest is the CQ Worldwide Contest, which takes place in October and November each year. There are separate events for CW and for sideband. And uh, in that contest, countries are multipliers. And there are stations um, go on what are called de-expeditions to all the, re the remote and rare countries in the world. And towards the end of the contest, even they will hear you even if you're weak. If you can hear them, you can be certain they will hear you. And if you call them, they will work you. So some of the contests for beginners, <coughs> IRTS, 40 and 80 meters counties, uh, UK contests, the RSGB uh, Club Calls Contest, they call them. They're on 80 metres. They only last for 90 minutes. And uh, from EI, we work the UK only. More recent <coughs> are the UK and Ireland Contest Club. Um, and you don't have to be a member. Um, they run 80 metre uh, contests once a month. They only last an hour, and you can work everyone. And IOTA is one of the big contests in the year, run by the RSGB. And uh, what happens is that lots of people activate uh, islands, 
particularly around Europe, and you get extra points and multipliers for working different islands. The international contests, which tend to be at least 24 hours, CQ Worldwide, which I've already mentioned, CQ WPX, where multipliers are prefixes. Um, do you know what prefixes are, beginners? So, for example, my call EI5 would be a prefix. If you worked on another EI5, uh, it wouldn't be a multiplier, but it would still count for points. The IRRLDX is held in February and March, and you, we work only Americans and Canadians, and states and provinces are the multipliers for us. Um, IIRUHF is a mixed mode contest held in the summer, and it's 24 hours, and again, everybody works everybody. And the Russian DX is an, another uh, very popular one. So how do you find out uh, when and where the contests <coughs> are taking place? Well, it's very simple. You just go to um, Google and type in contest calendars, and you've got all the information you need. But um, uh, there's a website called contesting.com, and it lists all the contests, and you'll soon find that there's something on of relevance every week. There's always something that you can try. Um, we mentioned the IRTS counties contest, and the next one is on the 17th of May next month. Um, you'll also see contests listed in EI News, which is emailed uh, to IRTS members each month. I think I can show you that. So that's what it looks like there. Don't know if this, oh, wrong one. So can you tell from that when's the next contest that might be relevant? Or is there, on, is there one on at the moment? Well, you see this. On the 25th from 1300 um, UTC, the Helvetica contest, which is where we work Swiss amateurs. It's all modes, CW, sideband, and digital. And what you do is you send a serial and you log whatever district or, or Swiss canton that they send you, and you work uh, Switzerland only. But a very simple contest, very easy to work a few Swiss stations, get a few points, and, and have a bit of fun. And every Wednesday throughout the year, there are one hour, there are three separate one hour contests. Now they're CW only, run by the CW Ops uh, organization, but they're open to everyone. And they're t I think they're 40, 15, uh, I, I think they're now all banned. Used to be 20 and 15 only. So uh, don't be shy, uh, have a go. It's, it's easy on, on, on sideband in particular, even if you don't know. Now, just before we go on to contest logging, a little bit about my station here. This is an Ellicraft K3 uh, transceiver with a panoramic adapter, the, the, or a pan adapter. The pan adapter shows you what stations are, shows you band activity around your own frequency, which is in the center here. And it's very handy for uh, getting a feel for what's happening all around you. To me, using a radio without a pan adapter is like driving a car without any mirrors. You can see exactly where you're going and what's ahead of you, but you've no feel for what's happening all around you. You feel you're, you're wearing blinkers without one of those. Um, you've probably seen the Heil headsets and you know, decided you might like to save up and get, get one of them. I wouldn't recommend it for contesting because they're too big and heavy and they hurt your ears especially if you wear glasses. So I use the simplest mobile microphones like this. Just fits like that. It can be bent, and that's all you need. And for headphones, I use in-ear in earphones like these. And they have uh, flexible inserts that go in right into your ear. They're, they're light, you don't know you're wearing them, and they, they keep out a lot of sound. So if, if you're working in a multi-operator environment, it cuts down a lot of the noise from the other operators. And it's extremely light. And for, in a sideband contest, the last thing you want is a, a hand microphone with push to talk. Because if, when you're doing contest logging, you need both hands free for logging. So I use a foot switch like this. Just press it, and it uh, puts the rig into transmit. 
Very simple, but very effective. OK, let's have a quick look at uh, contest logging. Um, well, I think it's obvious why you would use a, a, a computer to do your logging, because otherwise you have to do it on paper. You have to record times, frequencies, call signs. Uh, you have to add up and calculate the points <laughs> yourselves. You have to make sure you avoid dupes, because people don't like you calling them for a second time on the same band, because you don't get any points for dupes. You don't lose any points, but it's, it's just a waste of everybody's time. And the statistics keep you motivated. And what do I mean by statistics? What statistics do you think there might be? Well, really, they, they tell you how fast you're working uh, the stations. And I think we might uh, spend two or three minutes just, just trying this. Let's see, can I do this? OK. I've set this up. Uh, this is the CQ Worldwide CW contest with my own contest logger called SD. And we're going to have a mini contest. I know it says CW, but we're going to pretend it's sideband. And I'm going to call CQ. And I want you to come back. Just You needn't shout. Just talk call signs at me, and I'll try and log a few. So uh, CQ contest, Echo India 5 Delta India. Echo India 5 Delta India contest. I'm not getting out. Don't hear any replies. <laughs> <laughs> I need a better antenna. CQ contest, Echo India 5, Delta India. Contest. EI2, Hotel India, Bravo, 5914. Ah, I forgot to, yeah, I need to turn that off. Right. OK, in this one, you give your zone. And the software pre-fills the zone, depending on the, on the country. And it's uh, 14. Now, you also see the software tells you that this is going to be a new country, and it's going to be a new zone on 15 meters. And the zone will be 14. This is where you a uh, contest where really all you need to <coughs> log is, uh, is call signs. OK, we've now logged that. And we got no points. Because in this contest, you don't get any points for your own country. But it does count as a country multiplier and a zone multiplier. So our score is still zero, even though we have two multipliers. CQ contest, Echo India 5, Delta India. Contest. 8 Papa 6 Papa Zulu. 8 Papa 6 Papa Zulu, 5914. 5914. Oh, no, you're not. You're number eight. OK, thanks for number eight. <laughs> OK, so now we've logged two QSOs. And look, our, our QSO rate per hour is 105.9, but it's just gone down because we're standing here wasting time. You need to keep working them to keep the rate up. So, CQ contest, Echo India 5, Delta India. CQ contest, Echo India 5, Delta India. Contest. K3 LR 5914. That's five, that's okay, thank you. Okay, our rate has gone back up to 102. And in five seconds, it'll go, it'll go down again. Now, um, how fast can you realistically keep the rate up to? Or what, what, what do you think would be reasonable targets? Well, I'll tell you what, let's work a few more just while, we, um, while we're in the mood. So you can contest Echo India 5, Delta India, contest. G3XTT. G3XTT, hi, Don, 5914. 5914. Thank you. I'm going to do something here. Let me see if it does this work. I'm going to load. Uh, this will do. No, I don't know what it is. Excuse me a second. I'm just loading a, con a call sign reference file. Control C, that's D. Uh, so if, I if Don calls me again, Ah, mistake. Immediately knows Don, and I have a the, the number there is just a club membership number. So, all right. Our, now our load slip. We're down to 80, 80 an hour, which is uh, not much more than uh, one minute. Now one minute is very, very slow. So seek a contest. Echo India five Delta India contest. Yeah, EI three HQB five nine one four. Thank you. QRZ, Echo India, 5 Delta India. Alpha 9 
Anine two I O, five nine one four. Where are you, Alpha Nine Two? Nine one four. Five nine twenty one. Thanks. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, that was a country multiplier and a zone multiplier, and our rate has gone back up to a hundred an hour. So if we kept the going, we'd have a zone multiplier of about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay. Thank you. 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 Which is uh, every uh, seven or eight seconds you can work a station, <coughs> or every t every ten seconds anyway. Right. Let's see where we were. You're going to be good at typing that. No, not really, because all you've got to type is the call sign and hit enter. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, I wasn't typing it as fast as uh, the people were calling out the call signs, but you do have to know your way around the keyboard. But that only matters when you're calling CQ. If you're calling other stations, you can take all the time you need to get their call sign and have it in, already entered, before you call them. Then what you get from them is just a serial or a zone number or whatever, and that's all you have to type and then hit enter, and the QSO is logged. So you do need basic keyboard skills, and it helps to know your logging software, because otherwise you'll struggle to do uh, uh, ed edits in a hurry. So, oh, you oh yeah, you do need to connect it to the rig. I'll show you that this is, yeah. You know, I don't ever have to worry about frequency or anything. If I want to go to 20 meters on the rig, I just do this. B20 should do it. Oops. And the rig is now on 20 meters. The band has changed to 20 meters and it's gone to whatever frequency it was last on in 20 meters. Um, if I, if, I, if I work um, W3LPL on 20 meters, and then he says, how about um, 28400? I just type in 28400. I do Q. There he is. I work him. I go hit F10 twice, and I'm back in my own frequency. So I can move stations to other bands and come back to my run frequency in seconds. Uh, Yes, the radio, well, all, radio, all modern radios are compatible with computers because they all have serial connections. Right, we've got to move on because we're running out of time. So I've been contesting since 61. Uh, I was 17 then and I'm 71 now. I wonder if there's any significance. <laughs> so I reckon I've only another 20 or 30 good years left for contesting. <laughs> I've been programming since 1966, <laughs> one way or another. First was uh, Elliott Autocode, then Fortran 4, then COBOL. I started coding SD in 1989, first in GW Basic, which was a standard um, um, programming tool with, with DOS. Then I migrated to Turbo Basic, Power Basic, and for the last uh, 10 or 11 years, it's been in uh, Power Basic for Windows. Now, how many modes are there? Dozens. There's not really. There's only three modes. Um, there's phone, and uh, well, particularly for DXCC purposes, which is the DX Century Club. All phone modes are simply recognised as the one, whether it's CW, sorry, whether it's sideband, FM, AM, or DSB. All data modes uh, are count as one mode, and you know there are dozens of data modes. And next month there will be more because anybody who could string more than two lines of code together can come up with a, a new data mode. Uh, now, I say they're all the same, but what, in what respect are they all the same? They're all the same in that you need a computer or a machine to decode them. Now, CW is a data mode because it can be decoded by machine. But the difference is that it can be decoded by people. And if you need a, a decoder to decode your Morse for you, you really can't claim to know Morse code because you're treating it as a data mode. <coughs> All right, well, we've done the demonstration on logging QSOs. I showed you the QSO <coughs> rate window. Um, check partial window is a bit specialized. We've, we're, I don't have the time. Uh, so let me t um, <coughs> look briefly about um, the history of telecommunications and uh, where amateur radio stands today. 
200 years ago, <coughs> the only overseas communication was by sea. If you wanted to get, uh, ask somebody a question in the States, you had to send the question by letter post on a ship, wait for it to be re re replied to and wait for that ship to come back. It could take you two or three months to get an answer. 150 years ago, in the 1850s or so, the first undersea cable uh, was led in the North Atlantic, and that was a wired telegraphy. And then 100 years ago, we had wireless telegraphy, and Marconi is the name that comes to mind. Now, what's the difference between wireless telegraphy and wired telegraphy? Well, with yeah, that makes all the difference. Now, um, I've, I've read that um, uh, Albert Einstein was once asked to describe uh, wireless telegraphy. He said, think of a very long cat with its tail in Dublin and its head in New York. If you pull its tail in Dublin, the head meows in New York. That's, that's wired telegraphy. Now, wireless telegraphy is exactly the same, except that there's no cat. So how does it work? It really is magic because there is nothing between this little box here, putting out the same amount of power as one of those lights, and yet it can activate enough electrons in the ionosphere or, or around the world to produce a signal in, your, in another radio uh, 15 or 16,000 kilometers away, and um, for us, the two of us to have uh, communications. That, to me, that is the magic of wireless or radio. And yet now we have the internet and we're back effectively to wired telegraphy, except it's very much faster than it was. Now, at home, I have one of the fastest internet connections in the country. I have a solid 240 megabits a second. I have about 10 internet-enabled devices throughout the house, but my radio isn't one of them. I keep it separate from the, the internet because for the simple reason, uh, here's a book that was published 50 years ago uh, describing the first 50 years of wireless and it's called World at Their Fingertips, written by John Clary Coates, a man I met at least once in the 60s. Uh, in, the, in those days, we were special because we were the only people non-professionals outside the telecommunications industries who had person-to-person -person communications uh, for free, effectively. <coughs> now, everybody is special. We all have the internet. It's effectively free. There's free Wi-Fi in this hotel. You can contact anybody anywhere in the world for free if you know their Skype uh, ID. Uh, so, we're not special anymore. The only way we can still be special is to use w radio or wireless and nothing else. Because really, uh, the way I see it is, the way, from the amateur radio point of view, the internet puts the wires back into wireless. I don't see the point of mixing the two ever, although I'm in a bit of a minority there. So, there's my station at home. It's exactly as you see there. The only uh, addition is a desk lamp and a rotator. Uh, now, my motto for contesting is one small radio is enough. One small computer is enough. That's, uh, I think, a 10-inch 10, 10 screen. Minimize your eye and head movement. And finally, antennas can never be too big. Now, I'm going to do a quick demo. Uh, a lot of you don't know Morse code, but some of you do. Now, I'd like somebody to come up here who can, who can type. Any, anybody? Now, anybody, can, anybody? Come on. You can type. Come on. All right. It doesn't matter. You just have to type a question. Let me just check that this works. That didn't Two work. Minutes. Two minutes, okay. This didn't work, so let's just see why. Uh, it's 
not working. I was going to do you a demo, I'll show you just how Morse's magic gets you. Hook. You're off the hook. Get you to type a question, and I, you know, without looking at the screen, I'd answer the question for you. But we have a technical glitch. So, really, to summarise, get get on the air, get off the internet, and put the radio back into amateur radio. Now, any questions? Anything? This is, by the way, this is my Morse key, single paddle Morse key, not working. Let me just see why. Com three, com thirteen. Very well. One of the things you mentioned as well was that anyone could join in a contest. Yes. And also that you could really set the rules. Yes. Just so you know who to call and what the exchange is. That's right. I showed I showed you this uh, this the EI news. Just go back to that. Let me take us. Let's go to this one. Yes, you're, ab you're absolutely right. <coughs> now, um, IRTS members get this by email, and each of these uh, things in blue is a direct link to the rules. Yeah. So that's where you can check, check, check the rules. And there's links to some of the um, relevant contest calendars. Yes. And now you're trying to figure out what it is. Yes, you can make a mistake because, you know, if you're meant to be calling uh, Americans only, yeah. nobody else outside America will thank you for calling them. So you just have to ch check the rules. Yeah. I, I think the solution is use the internet every Friday, check one of the contesting websites, see what's on, see if we're interested, see if we're not. Absolutely, yes. That's the easiest way to do yes. it. Yes. And don't call CQ if you're a beginner, call the other stations. Then there's no embarrassment if you don't copy what they send you, because you just say thanks. <laughs> no, and they don't know any better. <laughs> but it's you know when you when you get to the stage where you can call CQ and handle a, what I would call a mini pileup, uh, you need to have your wits about you. and You need a little bit of practice. Just one or two contests I think also require strange things. I think one of the Japanese looks for your, your age or something. Your like age. That. First time I did that contest, my age was 19. <laughs> yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'd like you all to show your appreciation for Paul O'Kane and for sharing his <laughs>